Welcome to PCAP's seventh annual Prairie Scott the Goods Week. My name is Caitlin Rose Taylor and I'm the Stewardship Coordinator with the Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan or PCAP. Today, Marika Olinek will be speaking about prairie pollination. I'd like to start by saying we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations and communities, past and present. For a millennia, they have worked to protect these landscapes and the life these areas sustain. I would like to thank these original caretakers and acknowledge the ongoing work and presence of Indigenous peoples in Canada today. Before we get going, I'd like to mention that there are two other webinars happening this week for Prairie's Got the Goods Week. Uh, this afternoon, there'll be a webinar about wetlands and drainage, and tomorrow will be about carbon credits. You can register for these webinars on the PCAP website, just click on upcoming events and then Prairie's Got the Goods Week. And past webinars will be uploaded on the PCAP YouTube channel um, and this webinar will be up there too in the near future. A reminder to our listeners out there, if you have any questions during the uh, presentation, just type into the questions section of the webinar dashboard anytime and questions will be answered towards the end of the webinar. I'd like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our presenting sponsors, Canadian Forage and Grasslands Association and Wildlife Habitat Canada. And our supporting sponsor is Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association and in-kind support has been provided by NCC. So without further ado, today's presenter is Marika Olenek and she is an ecologist and educator who currently works as a stewardship coordinator with the Nature Conservancy of Canada in Manitoba. Marika has worked for several years in the fields of conservation biology, community development and education with a variety of non-profit organizations as well as with provincial and federal governments. She holds a master's degree in natural resources management from the University of Manitoba and has worked in ecology and land management in the areas of pollination, avian and prairie ecology. Raised near Saskatoon and currently residing in Winnipeg, Marika loves camping and canoeing while exploring new places across the country. She is passionate about developing meaningful ways for people to interact with the natural world and facilitates learning opportunities and connections in her volunteer time. So with that, I will pass it over. Okay, thanks so much, Caitlin. I'm just going to double check. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, perfect. Awesome. Okay, thank you. And thanks everybody for joining today. Um, as Caitlin mentioned, my name is Marika Olenek. I'm coming from you today from Winnipeg, which is Treaty 1 territory, as well as the homeland of the Métis Nation. And as Caitlin mentioned, I was uh, raised in Saskatchewan, just out of Saskatoon, outside of Saskatoon, which is Treaty 6 land. Um, I'm going to be talking today about the importance of prairie pollination. I'm going to be talking at a fairly high level, um, trying to keep things pretty general. Um, and so I just wanted to say, as with everything with the natural world, there's always exceptions, there's always all kinds of complications. So what I'm saying today is more general. And if you're interested in learning more or getting more into the weeds with some of these topics, I will provide my contact info. I'm happy to get in touch and hopefully can provide some resources and ways for you to think about this a bit more. So We'll dive right in. I'm going to talk a bit about what pollination is and who our pollinators are here in the Canadian prairies. And then we'll get into what are some of their needs, what are some of the challenges, and also some of the ways that we can help with their conservation. So first and foremost, let's go back to what might be, I don't know, high school biology for some of you. What is pollination? Let's make sure we're all on the same page. So pollination is something that occurs for our flowering plants. The majority of plants on the planet are flowering plants. And just like almost anything else that's alive, they need to reproduce. And the way that that happens is that our pollen, which is basically the male reproductive uh, cells, need to come in contact with the ovule, which is our female reproductive cells. And there's a lot of different ways that that can happen. Um, many plants can actually self-pollinate. So that can look like when um, the little pollen area of the flower can, the pollen can come in contact and simply fertilize the ovule on its own. We can also see wind pollination. Wind pollination is something we see in a lot of our grass species here on the prairies, as well as some of our trees, for example. Um, these are our plants where the pollen is light enough to be carried by the wind. If you're like me and you get hay fever in the late summer when the ragweed and other things tend to be blooming, then you know that wind pollination is occurring. And then for a lot of our plants, 
they need something to help them move the pollen. Their pollen is too heavy for the wind. It needs to get moved to the center. And ideally, in many cases, it's going from one flower all the way to another flower so that you get cross-pollination and you get uh, greater genetic, genetic diversity than you would get simply then with uh, self-pollination. And so that is done by animals. And in many cases, it is done by insects, moving pollen around from flower to flower. And that's what we're going to be focusing on today. So this pollination system is a system that is a service to those plants. Plants get help with their reproduction. They get help with their genetic diversity. And in turn, the insects or the animal pollinators are getting a reward. And that reward is in the form of food. As many of you would likely know, uh, insects are visiting flowers looking for nectar or looking for pollen or for both. And so this is what we call a symbiotic relationship, which is sort of a fancy way of saying a mutually beneficial relationship. This ecosystem service occurs and has co-evolved over time. We get a wide diversity of plants and a wide diversity of pollinators that fit together. Some of them are specialists, so that means that uh, perhaps a certain flower can only be pollinated by a certain type of insect, or it might mean that a insect can only get its food from a certain type of flower. Those are our specialists. And we also have a large number of generalists. So a bumblebee, for example, can visit many different types of flowers and get food from them. And there's all kinds of a spectrum in between from very, very strong generalists and very strong specialists and everything in between. And we call this also an ecosystem service because ecosystem services, if you've been attending some of the webinars this week, are services and benefits that we as humans receive from these natural processes that are ongoing. And we'll get a little bit more into what we receive in just a moment, but first I just wanna talk about who are the pollinators that matter here in the Canadian prairies. So when I talk about pollination, often when I talk to people, the first thing that pops into their mind is of course honeybees. Honeybees are very important pollinators globally. They are a managed species, which means that humans take care of them, often in these colonies. And basically, I like to think of them as similar to livestock. Honeybees are not native to the Canadian prairies. They were brought here from Eurasia, not unlike a lot of our livestock. Um, we take care of them, and they provide very important services for us. They have very important roles across the world and in, also in the prairies for agricultural pollination of crops, as well as providing things like honey and associated uh, products from that process. Um, however, they are not generally living wild. They are being taken care of by us. They're being bred and managed by humans. And so while they become important, there are a wide variety of other pollinators that I'm going to be focusing on today. And we'll start with some of these native bees. So wild bees are really diverse. And I show just a few images here to give you an idea of the different appearances, the sizes, the shapes that we see in wild bees. Um, many people are often familiar with bumblebees, but they don't realize how many different types and colors and sizes of bees that we have here in the Canadian prairies. And actually, in terms of number of bees, the prairies are uh, very important. Uh, the prairies ecozone has um, about 400 species of bees. There's still some research going every now and then there's a new one detected. And this is one of the highest uh, diverse areas for bees in Canada, probably second only to the Western Interior Basin, that's this area out here in uh, central BC. And the thing about wild bees is they're actually really different in terms of how they live from honeybees. As most people know, honeybees are living in large colonies. They have a single queen that leaves all the eggs and the other bees are helping take care of the young. There's often thousands upon thousands of bees in a single colony. And this is really different than most of our wild bees. Wild bees, for the most part, are solitary. There are some social species, like our bumblebees, that do have small seasonal colonies that only last one year. But most bees, the females are actually laying their own eggs provisioning food for their own young all by themselves, or sometimes in a, the same location as other bees, but they're not necessarily living in any sort of colony uh, pattern. Another really important thing about our bees, uh, or our wild bees, that is, is that uh, they're not living in, you know, boxes provided by humans. Um, many of the bees are nesting underground. They are either digging or using existing tunnels underground to lay their eggs. And then another batch of them are tending to use um, small cavities above ground where they will find a safe place to make their nest. 
And then finally, another big difference is that they're not producing honey. Um, we are not getting these excess products that you get through honeybees. And so just the entire sort of life cycle and life history is what we call it, the way that they um, survive and reproduce is very different from most of our native bees. And nonetheless, they're very important pollinators. And because of the diversity of them, they can provide a high degree of diversity in terms of the pollination services and the interactions they have with our native plants. We'll get into why bees are so important in just a moment, but I want to highlight a couple other insect pollinators here in the prairies. Probably second to bees in terms of importance for pollination are flies. And there are a wide number of flies that visit flowers and can pollinate them in the prairies. Some of the more common ones are termed flower flies or hover flies or surfid flies, but there's also a few other different types. Um, the further north you go, the more you tend to see flies become important as pollinators. So once you get up into Arctic ecosystems, flies are the primary pollinators as they tend to dominate that ecosystem. Most flies that are visiting flowers are there to eat pollen as their reward. And this differs a little bit from uh, some of our bees that are getting both pollen and nectar. But we do see like, as an example on the bottom left of my screen, there's some bee flies that are drinking nectar from, from flowers. Generally speaking, uh, flies are important because there are so many of them visiting flowers and some of them are quite effective at moving pollen around, but overall not as effective as our bee species. And then we also have a variety of other insects. Many people are familiar with moths and butterflies. As flower visitors, they tend to eat, uh, be uh, pollinators when they're drinking nectar from flowers. We also um, will see wasps, beetles, and some types of ants, as well as pollinators occasionally, although not usually as effectively in our ecosystems here in the prairie. <clears throat> Excuse me. One thing that you might have noticed, uh, I haven't said is some of these larger non-insect pollinators, things like um, bats, small rodents, hum hummingbirds, and that's because they're not as important in our ecosystems. In tropical areas, you may get things like bats as pollinators, but we don't have that here. So the focus of my talk today, all about pollination from here on in is going to be 100% talking about these insects. I'm going to focus on the bees, but you'll end up, we'll be talking about some of these other pollinators as well. So what makes a good pollinator? Why are the bees the best pollinators? Why not the other ones? And when we're thinking about pollination to a plant, basically what we're going to be thinking about is quantity and quality. So quantity is the number of flowers that an insect is going to visit. How quickly are they moving around? How many different flowers do they get to? How much of that cross-pollination, that movement of pollen can they do? And then quality. Quality is uh, basically the different types of behaviors that those insects have, as well as the amount of pollen that they can carry on the body. And to show you an example of sort of a contrasting of a different quality visit to a flower, I have two short videos here. We'll watch them both a couple times because they're just a few seconds long and I am hoping I can get them to work. Just one second. That didn't help. Okay. Uh, the laser pointer won't let me do it. Just give me a moment. I apologize for this. Here we go. Okay, so this first video is going to be, uh, it's a wild rose, and this is a type of uh, flower fly visiting it. And I'm hopefully you can all see this. I'll play it a second time. But you can see this fly is busy eating pollen, and then moves off to another flower. We'll watch it again. It's using its tongue to interact with what are called the anthers of the plant, where the pollen is produced. And it just sort of walks around on the plant, gets what it needs, and takes off. In contrast, these were both videos I took in Alberta, not too far apart from each other. Um, so on the same flower, here is a mining bee, and she is very actively gathering pollen onto her body. And you can see the way that she works over the anthers of the plant, the way that she is gathering the pollen onto her body. You may even be able to tell that she has a big basket of pollen collected on her hind leg. And so that behavior, difference between the bee and the fly really makes a big difference in how much pollen they get on their bodies, how much they're getting into the flower and likely to transfer that pollen to lead to fertilization. And so what we end up with are bees being much more effective pollinators because both again they have that quantity and that quality. 
And why is that? Well, it's because bees are really specialized. They need pollen in order to feed their young. The larval forms, the juvenile forms of bees, feed exclusively on pollen, and that's what makes them really unique among insects, and also what makes them such important pollinators, because not only are they feeding off of the nectar when they're flying around as adult bees, but they're actively gathering that up. And here's a shot that just shows you um, a bumblebee with what's called her pollen baskets on her hind leg. And she's been gathering up pollen and carrying it on her legs. She's gonna take that back to her nest in order to feed her young. So we see that bees become really important because they rely so much on those flower products throughout the course of their life. And we'll get into that even a bit more in a few minutes. So why is pollination so important? Well, uh, first and foremost, the ecosystem service it provides to us is crop pollination. And across the world, there's a, a really wide variety of crops and especially a lot of fruits and vegetables that rely on insect pollination in order to produce the fruits and vegetables that we enjoy. And when we think about that, a lot of them are pollinated by honeybees. Uh, there's a huge industry of moving honeybees around um, on trucks for crop pollination to ensure that they're there at the right bloom time to pollinate those flowers. But wild insects are also really important for pollination. And so this graph that I'm showing is from Garibaldi et al. It was a study in 2013. And they sort of standardized the value or the service that different types of insects can provide for the pollination of a variety of crops that you see across the bottom. And so the green dots and the green bars are how much honeybees can provide and the pink dots are wild insects. And so in the case of many of these crops, wild insects are as important or more important than honeybees for pollinating and ultimately providing these crops to us as humans. And so that might include things such as almonds, coffee, uh, cotton for shirts. We see things that might grow here like water or sunflower. We also see things like watermelon and pumpkins, cucumbers. These are all uh, plants that require insect pollination. So this is just to demonstrate that we're getting a lot of value in terms of our commercial crops and the things that we enjoy as humans. Uh, here in the prairies, probably the primary crop that we're getting um, pollination services for is canola. And for canola, we're seeing both honeybees, but also wild bees being important, not just wild bees, wild insects, because flies will also pollinate, uh, being important pollinators for canola. And in areas where canola is grown that have some natural areas left on the landscape, we tend to see even higher value of those wild insects in terms of pollinating canola. Another crop that's grown here on the prairies is uh, soybeans. Soybeans are mostly self-pollinated, but there is some uh, growing evidence that having wild bees uh, present helps increase the yield of soy production and uh, therefore improves the economic value of these crops. And then uh, another important one here on the prairies is alfalfa. And this is a key forage crop that we use for feeding livestock as well as for growing in haylands. And alfalfa gets pollinated by a wide variety of uh, bees, especially larger bodied bees, because alfalfa's kind of got a little trap and the little flower has to get open. So the bee has to be big enough in order to uh, pollinate it. With alfalfa, we actually have a second, um, a second managed pollinator that we use here in the prairies. Some of you may have been driving through hay fields and alfalfa fields, and you would have seen little huts out on the prairie, things like they're often blue or orange. And those are actually nesting sites for these guys. These are, uh, uh, basically alfalfa bees. They've been brought over from Europe because they're very effective and efficient at pollinating alfalfa, even though other bees can do so as well. And so alfalfa producers, especially those who are growing seed and growing it in a commercial way, will manage these bees and keep them on their lands in order to ensure that pollination. But as I mentioned, we still see pollination of alfalfa from a variety of other bees. So we get the crop pollination services, which is really important economically as well as to our own enjoyment of food. Um, but then getting a little bit deeper, I mentioned that about 90% of flowering plants benefit from pollination by animal pollinators. And so the vast majority of plants uh, either require or are helped significantly by that pollination service. And this is something that's really important because when it comes down to it, plants are at the heart of all of our ecosystems. Plants are the living things that can take that energy from the sun, those nutrients from the soil, and produce uh, growth that basically everything else relies on, uh, whether it's herbivores that eat those plants or carnivores that eat those herbivores, 
ultimately it's our what we call primary producers our plants that are at the heart of all these ecosystems as well if you're going to be thinking about other ecosystem services um, as caitlin mentioned there'll be talks on things like carbon sequestration or water regulation in wetlands um, plants are at the heart of all of those processes as well so maintaining uh, diverse and healthy plant communities is really important and that doesn't happen without the pollination services that are provided by our insect pollinators I just wanted to show this graph. It's uh, borrowed from Tillman et al., which was uh, a study done in 20, 2006. There's a number of other studies that support this, though. And that's this idea that as we increase, uh, across the bottom here, as we increase the number of species in our ecosystem, we see that the stability of that ecosystem increases. So what does that mean? It means if there are weather events, if there are other disturbances, it means change over time um, basically can be uh, stabilized so that we don't see catastrophic changes in ecosystems and so that diversity of plants which is inherently tied to that diversity of pollinators becomes important for stability and resilience of our natural ecosystems so bringing it all back our little pollinators these bees and flies that are flying around are really at the heart of maintaining almost everything that's going on uh, both in the natural world but also the uh, the benefits and the services that we gain from them so what do these little insects need in the prairies in order to keep functioning, to stay alive, to reproduce? Well, they obviously need flowers. That's first and foremost. We know that they are pollinators. They get their food from flowers, or at least they get their food as adults from flowers. And you're gonna want a diversity of flowers for a diversity of pollinators. Some pollinators like a bumblebee are going to be out all summer long and they are going to visit different flowers that are blooming at different times of the year. Some pollinators, some of our wild bees, uh, mining bees, for example, a big family of bees, um, they tend to mostly emerge in the early summer. And so they're going to be visiting flowers that are also blooming in the early summer. So they're going to need different ones. As well, we get degrees of what we call generalization and specialization. This is a very simplified version of a pollination network. So we've got our flowers here across the top. We've got our insects here across the bottom. And some of them are very specialized. Over here on the left, we've got a specialized flower, this orchid, that is only pollinated by this specialized uh, pollinator, this hawk moth. In some cases, we have a specialized flower, which gets pollinated by our bumblebee, but this bumblebee is actually a generalist. It's visiting a wide variety of flowers. So we get these uh, different networks and we get different interactions happening on both sides. And I point to this just to point out um, that this is why we have this importance of a variety of pollinators and as well as a variety of plants. For example, our canola crop is going to bloom sometime in like uh, late July, midsummer, and it's gonna provide a whole lot of food. If there's wild insects out there, there's a lot of them they wanna visit that canola crop because there's suddenly, we call it a mass flowering event. There's suddenly thousands, if not millions of flowers available, but that's only for a few weeks of the year. And so for the, other insects to survive or for those insects to survive outside of the time that the canola is blooming, we're going to have to have a variety of flowers on the landscape year round. So then we're going to be thinking about, well, what else do they need besides just flowers? When we're seeing our insect pollinators, we're usually seeing them in the adult phase of their life. And that means that's when they are flying around, that's when they're visiting the flowers. But actually, that's usually only for less than half the year and often only for a few weeks of the year. So what are they doing the rest of the time? Well, in the case of bees, they're going to be gathering up that pollen and they're going to be laying eggs. This is a little example of, the, of a, a nest site in the ground. As I mentioned, many of them nest underground and actually that pollen's gonna be laid with a little egg on top or next to it. And when that egg hatches, it's gonna be a larva and bee larvae are going to be eating that pollen. They're then going to go through a pupa stage. This can actually last quite a long time. Um, some of our wild bees will actually pass the entire winter in a pupa stage, sort of in a stasis before they eventually emerge again as an adult. And so when we think about flowers, that's what the adults are visiting, but what else is needed throughout the, year, the course of the year becomes important. We're gonna need nest sites, safe nest sites. We're gonna need winter sites, safe winter sites for those bees. So thinking about nesting, if we're talking about ground nesting bees, which is a lot of our bees, access to the right soil types, access to soils that are undisturbed becomes very important 
Uh, croplands are generally not great places for ground nesting bees because of regular killing uh, basically kills off the young so that they can't survive. We also see a lot of bees nesting above ground. Here on the left is a nice little bee checking out a hollow stem as a place to lay eggs, a little rose stem. And uh, on the right, we have a leaf cutter bee. She's carrying a piece of leaf that she cut and is going to be taking that back to her nest site, some sort of little uh, hidden cavity, maybe in a piece of wood or somewhere safe where she's going to lay eggs. And so providing these kind of undisturbed natural areas for above ground nesters also becomes important. Flies have a very similar life cycle as all insects do. They go from the adult, which lays the eggs, down into the larval stage, go through a pupa stage before emerging as adults again. But flies have very different needs, especially at their larval stage. So many of our flower visiting flies are going to have larvae that are, say, predaceous. Uh, they're actually going to be out on plants eating aphids, for example. We also, especially here in the eastern prairies, where it tends to be a little bit wetter, we have a lot of flies that are aquatic or semi-aquatic. And so they're going to be laying their eggs near or in wetlands. They might be eating, say, decaying uh, vegetation material in those wetlands. And so with flies, what we're seeing is the community of pollinating flies is very much dependent on what types of larval habitat there are will, in order to determine what types of flies are going to survive on the landscape. And then again, similarly, are butterflies and moths. And in terms of butterflies and moths, this is the monarch butterfly diagram I've got here. What we see is that they tend to be laying their eggs on vegetation, on plants. And then the larval stage, the caterpillars, are eating plants as their main source of food. And we get, again, degrees of specialization or generalization with, with moths and butterflies. Some, like the monarch butterfly, can only eat maybe a certain type or a certain family of plants. In the case of Monarchs, they are eating milkweeds. We have some that are more generalist. They lay their eggs on a variety of different types of plants and their caterpillars can munch on a bunch of different types of leaves. It really depends. But generally speaking, the presence and the diversity that we see of moths and butterflies is going to depend on whether their larval food plants are available. And so where you get a greater diversity of these sort of food plants, you're likely to see a greater diversity of moths and butterflies. Of course, we live in Canada, so it's not going to look like this all the time. Habitat also means somewhere safe to spend the winter. Monarch butterflies get to fly to Mexico, which I guess a few other Canadians get to do. But like most of us, myself included, we're spending most of our winters right here in the cold in the winter. And that's what the insects are doing as well. They're not going to be active. They're going to be in a state of stasis, basically. But they need somewhere safe where they're not going to be trampled or eaten or otherwise destroyed while they pass that winter time. Some are going to be underground in either burrows they dig themselves or reusing uh, tunnels or burrows dug by other insects or even rodents. Um, and some are going to be above ground. This picture has a nice picture of some clumping grasses right here in the middle. Our prairie grasses provide nice kind of clumped areas where a little tiny insect might be able to hide, remain safe, not get too much snow on top of them, these kind of things. So having safe and undisturbed areas in the wintertime also becomes important for our pollinator habitats. And then finally, I wanted to talk just a little bit about sort of how big of a habitat do pollinators need? And this can vary a lot. Uh, large bees, uh, such as honeybees, but also like bumblebees and a few others, can fly fairly long distances relative to how tiny they are. So they can go a few, a few kilometers usually. And bees generally are moving away from their nest sites. They're coming, they are gonna have a location that they build their nest and they're gonna what we, they're gonna forage out and then return to their nest site on a regular basis. We call them central place foragers. So they're gonna be moving around. And I mentioned that they can move maybe a few kilometers if they're larger, but some of our smaller bees, and indeed many of our smaller bees are probably moving less than 500 meters generally speaking, at a time. They're not huge, they're not strong flyers. So we're talking fairly small habitat patches that they might be using. Moths and butterflies and flies are usually working in a bit of a different way. They're not central place foragers. They're gonna be moving through the landscape, finding resources, finding opportune spots to lay eggs, you know, the right larval host plants or the right habitat for the flies, that kind of thing. So they're not moving in and out from the same place, but they're still moving around the landscape. However, a lot of them aren't traveling huge distances at a time. They may be moving several hundred meters here and there. Some of the larger butterflies can move further distances, but some small ones probably don't move more than 
half a kilometer or a kilometer at the most over the course of their lifetime. So often habitat for pollinators are small, but we want it to be connected. So I show this picture of a landscape here, just to give some examples of <laughs> what the prairies tend to look like. This is uh, kind of in central eastern Saskatchewan. I just grabbed a screen grab of um, some satellite imagery. And what we see is mostly cropland that's not really gonna provide habitat uh, for our pollinators. We do see though that this might be some hayland or a pasture, maybe there's another one up here that looks like a pasture, but if each of these is a section of land, we're talking four miles maybe, that's a long distance in terms of connectivity. So we do uh, see the need for not necessarily always huge habitat, but we do wanna see connectivity, otherwise we're gonna see things like um, inbreeding or if something happens to this habitat, the pollinators can't escape to another habitat patch, this kind of thing. So we want to be always thinking about not just what's happening in a little habitat patch, but what's happening on that broader landscape as well, because both are going to ultimately be affecting the ability for pollinators to survive in the long term. So what are the challenges then that pollinators are facing? So many of you may have heard of things like honeybee colony collapse disorder. There's a lot of attention uh, towards that about, uh, I guess, going back 15, 20 years from now, it really started to gain a lot of attention. Researchers started looking into it. And then around that same time, we really started uh, paying attention to what was going on with wild pollinators and wild insects. Um, and so what we've seen is over the last 10 to 15 years, a lot of research and information coming out um, demonstrating that basically we're seeing really steep rates of declines for insects across the board. Uh, a large uh, study in Germany showed 75% decline in flying insects. And we don't have a study like that in Canada or in North America, but the studies that we have seen on specific uh, species, for example, on some different bumblebee species have really shown that we're seeing similar declines. Um, a lot of what happens in Canada is we just don't have the information on an individual species to say for sure what's happening with it. But when we do these uh, individual surveys or when we start to see um, aggregate surveys comparing change over time, we're seeing fairly steep declines across the board. We also have a number of um, officially designated at-risk species. These aren't all the only ones that are pollinators, but here are some of the ones we have in the prairies. We've got the yellow-belted bumblebee right in the middle top of my slide. That one has seen significant declines across its range. Uh, below that, in the middle, we have the monarch butterfly, which is one that most people tend to be aware of. I believe Kosiewicz, the committee that uh, assesses these types of things, has recently uh, confirmed it to be an endangered species. And with uh, monarchs, what we're seeing is that habitat loss is often a factor. Um, they require mo the milkweeds, remember that specialist kind of uh, need for their larval habitat. They require milkweeds, which have been disappearing across their breeding range through sort of central North America for a number of years. They may also have declines in their wintering habitat down in Mexico. And then we've also got a couple other specialist species. Um, on the left of my screen, I've got Powashik skipperling, and on the right, I've got Dakota skipper. Skippers are basically a little type of sort of uh, small butterfly. And the Powashiks are found only in Manitoba and Michigan now. They used to be spread out across sort of the eastern prairies. And Dakotas are found only in a few sites in uh, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and a, a couple states down in the US. Again a specialist on prairies. These, these two little guys both need um, prairie plants, prairie grasses, and prairie flowers in order to survive. And we've seen their habitat losses have really cut down their numbers to the point where both are listed as endangered. <clears throat> so specialist species often tend to be the ones that are declining the most rapidly in these studies. And a lot of the Right. reason that we're seeing four declines uh, over time is habitat loss. And on the prairies, that usually means conversion of native prairie uh, into other uh, land use types, usually agricultural or industrial land use types. And the thing about that is, uh, especially if it's marginal lands, which a lot of our more recently converted prairie is, is it may be productive for a number of years in terms of crop production, but once the prairie is gone, it's gone forever. And so then the habitat for those insects is also gone. <clears throat> we see that again, if I go back to my aerial photo here, uh, virtually all of this land is in crop production. It's going to be tilled, so we don't have ground nesting sites. It's uh, mostly being used up to the very edges of the field margin, so we don't uh, end up having um, pollinator habitat such as flowers or wintering habitat, these kind of things. 
<clears throat> and so that's what we get on the prairies. And this is definitely probably the biggest driver for losses over time. We also see related to that agricultural intensification over time. And so we're seeing this as an ongoing thing, loss of habitat fragments. An example of that might be that uh, an area that's been cropped for a long time, but has had its pothole wetlands remaining. Someone decides that they're gonna drain those pothole wetlands. And that last remaining little patch of native and natural habitat gets removed from the landscape. And actually we know from research that's been conducted out of labs at the University of Calgary that those pothole wetlands are actually really important locations where native pollinators are living and also coming from when they provide crop pollination services for canola. We're also seeing an increase in uh, monocultures, less diversity in cropping, less diversity in farming overall, um, less people in cattle production, for example, um, so then we don't have the same number of pastures and grasslands on the landscape. And then of course, uh, we're talking about insects, so we have to consider the effects of pesticides. Um, there's a number of <laughs> different pesticides in use, and the ones that have gotten a lot of attention are neonicotinoids. Um, these are about a third of pesticide use, I think, across the world at this point. And what we're seeing is um, sometimes new pesticides have been introduced over time, and we don't always know the effects that are happening on pollinators before they go into use. We're also seeing increased use across the board generally um, with that agricultural intensification over the last few decades, and that has definitely been uh, linked strongly with declining numbers of insects and pollinators. And the important thing also to note with pesticide use is that it can have both lethal and what we call sublethal effects. So lethal effects would mean you spray and you immediately are killing the insects that are present, the pollinators that are present. <clears throat> but sublethal effects might mean something like the pollen, the pollinator ingests some of that pesticide. We see this neonicotinoids because you know, nicotinoids are often being used as a systemic. So they are coating the seed from the start, the plant, all of the plant tissues then have neonicotinoids inside of them. And when a pollinator visits the flower, they're ingesting a small amount of that pesticide. And we can see sublethal effects, which might be effects on their neurological processing. They aren't able to behave the way that they need to in order to survive, or they are more prone, they are physically weakened, they might become more prone to uh, diseases or pathogens or parasites. So it's not outright killing the insects, but it's overall cumulatively affecting them and can over time reduce the amount of reproduction, the amount that they're able to survive in that landscape. Sort of related to this is we do see um, introduced pathogens and parasites. These are usually coming from honeybees. So if we see places where honeybees are interacting or sharing a flower, like in this picture I'm showing with closely related wild bees, they may be able to transfer, and they do sometimes transfer pathogens and parasites. Uh, bumblebees are more closely related to honeybees than some of our other wild bees, so they have been found to be at risk for this in some ecosystems. We also can see um, where honeybees increase the competition. And so what does that mean? It means if someone moves a few new hives of honeybees in, suddenly we've got tens of thousands of pollinators going for the same flowers, the same nectar, the same pollen that the wild insects are also going for. And they can actually remove those resources from the wild insects. So we see competition coming from honeybees. And that although honeybees are often in some ways not a huge threat, we may see increasing threats to them uh, when we're in a space where there's limited floral resources and those wild pollinators don't have anywhere else to go if the honeybees are taking everything up. Climate change is also a really big issue that's getting a lot more attention and there's a lot more research uh, starting to happen over the last few years to see what the effects are. Um, climate change, just like uh, say pesticides, can also co compound stresses that are already occurring. If, if a pollinator is not in its ideal sort of climate situation in terms of moisture, in terms of temperature, that can create additional stresses on their body. We may also see mismatch um, with flowering time. So say a bee likes to emerge in the early summer and it specializes on a flower that also blooms in the early summer. But with climate change, maybe that flower starts blooming a week or two earlier. And by the time that bee emerges, perhaps it can't find the flower that it needs to survive or vice versa, the bee emerges too soon. So there's definitely uh, potential effects for that on individual species and specialized species are likely to be the most at risk in these situations as well because a lot of our pollinators are small little insects. They're not moving very far. Um, 
their ability to shift their range uh, is sort of unknown. Um, if an area becomes too hot or too wet or too dry due to climate change, our pollinator is going to be able to move into the new areas that have the appropriate temperature and moisture conditions for them, or are they not going to be able to? Um, I haven't seen any research specifically on this in North America. I know people are looking at it, um, but there was sort of a large study done on this in Europe, and generally speaking, they found that most are unable to shift their range as, as the climate conditions change, and that could be quite worrying uh, if insects aren't able to survive in places where the climate is changing too rapidly for them to be able to move. The vulnerability of insects and insect pollinators partly comes into play because they have these multifaceted habitat needs. They need the flowers, they need the winter resource or larval resources, they need the winter habitat. Um, for bees as well, they are cognitively reliant. That means they have to use their memory and their learning because they're going back and forth from their nest out into foraging areas where they find flowers. And they rely a lot on memory and learning. Um, and so things that might affect their cognitive abilities like pesticides, neurological changes that can happen with those sublethal doses can be really uh, problematic. And then of course, I've kind of mentioned this, but none of these things is happening on its own. We see habitat loss at the same time that we're seeing increased pesticide use, at the same time that we're seeing climate changes, at the same time that we might be seeing pressures from honeybees or, or new diseases. So a lot of the times these threats are cumulative. It's not always just one thing that's going on at a time. So how do we help our pollinators? I'm gonna get into just a few examples. I'm happy to talk about this more if people wanna get in touch with me afterwards. I'm not an expert on policy, but there's a couple of key types of policies that might be really helpful for pollinator protection. One is a way to value our pollination services. These pollination services, for the most part, are what we call it often an externality. Um, they're something that we get, but we don't have a dollar value attached to them. We don't know how to pay for them. Um, and one way that we could be paying for them is looking at methods of doing payments to landowners for ecological goods and services. So if you don't, drain that wetland or you don't till up that pasture, perhaps you can get money for it because you're actually providing a service to society or to the economy, but you're not getting paid for it the way it is now. And there's definitely a lot of pilot programs going on. Uh, Nature Conservancy of Canada is involved with some of them and they differ by province for sure because of legislation, but uh, those are policies that can be really beneficial. And the other big one, in my opinion, is also regulations and guidelines on pesticides. A lot of times some of the effects that we see on uh, pollinators aren't actually known before a pesticide becomes evaluated and allowed to be used. And so they need to be evaluated and regulations do need to be updated and changed. We also need good guidelines for use so that people aren't overusing um, pesticides. So these kind of policy changes can have a big effect across the landscape. Uh, I'd say as well, very important is permanent protection of habitats, of natural habitats. This is a lot of the work that the Nature Conservancy of Canada does. And sometimes that looks like um, outright purchasing of lands, but it also can look like things like conservation easements. If a landowner um, doesn't want to have a wetland drain, they can permanently protect that on title through an easement agreement, um, or perhaps protect a pasture from being tilled up. We're also um, looking at different ways that we can uh, use new tools that are emerging to permanently protect lands. We can also uh, similarly use uh, sort of the services that are provided in order to protect, retain these natural areas. Um, cattle production is a good example where pasture land that isn't being tilled is often really great habitat with a lot of diversity for native pollinators, especially if it's native pasture. Creating habitat, um, you could create habitats if you live in an urban space, creating pollinator gardens, ripping up your lawn, because you know what a lawn doesn't do a lot for pollinators um, and just putting in a nice perennial garden can make a huge difference. Um, in crop areas, we see things like pollinator strips, which are untilled areas with perennial flowers uh, along the edges of croplands or perhaps at the corners of pivot agriculture. And when we think about land management, it doesn't matter how big or how small the land you manage is, there's some sort of like best practices that I'll just go over briefly here. Um, of course, maintaining a year-round diversity of flowers is really important. It's also great to retain native grasses. Uh, they can be host plants for moths and butterflies. They're also great for overwintering habitat. Um, and then along with maintaining these native species, we want to think about managing invasive weeds because invasive weeds really can decrease the biodiversity of plants, decrease the habitat for pollinators. And so 
even though something like say a Canada thistle, you might see a bunch of bees on it, they're not necessarily going to be the best habitat for all of our pollinators and they tend to crowd out a variety of other native species. So thinking about managing weeds is important. If you're going to be engaging in active land management, uh, some there's more details that you can get if you really want to get into the weeds of what you should do. Um, but more generally speaking, if you're going to be changing something, try to think of leaving what's called a refugia. Leave part of your land, whether it's a corner of your garden or whether it's uh, a paddock in your pasture, leave it unchanged for the year that you're applying management. So the pollinators have somewhere to go and then they can return back after you've applied management. So that might look like something like if you're doing prescribed burning, you might burn in a rotation. So you're not burning your entire uh, management unit all at the same time. You also might want to look at switching up timing year to year when you do things. So maybe you burn uh, an area in the spring. The next time you come back to burn it, maybe you burn it midsummer or in the fall. And that's going to encourage that diversity because you're not affecting the same pollinators always at the same time of year. When it comes to agricultural practices, light to moderate grazing, generally speaking, uh, here in the prairies is just fine and often beneficial for diversity of pollinators. Our pollinators evolved in a grazed prairie system, although it was bison instead of cattle. Um, or if you're using haying practices, you can try and hay with a bit of a higher mower, about 30 centimeters off the ground, moving slowly so flying insects can get out of the way and not get mowed down. Or you can use a flushing bar out front, which encourages them to fly away before the mower gets there. And then, of course, reducing pesticide use in agriculture becomes really important. Um, we have what's called that prophylactic use. That's when we're using the uh, pesticides, um, usually with a seed coating. Initially, from the start, we don't even need know if they're always it's always needed. It increases the amount of pesticide in the system. So maybe stopping prophylactic use and only using pesticides as needed becomes important. If you're not an agricultural producer, you may want to be thinking about where you're getting your plants if you're a gardener, because uh, a lot of them also have neonicotinoids uh, applied to them, and you can ask about that if you're purchasing from, say, a garden center. There's a lot more. I'm going to stop now, <laughs> but I just wanted to share a few resources before I go. Um, I do really value the Xerces Society resources, xerces.org. They have a, a whole lot. They're an invertebrate conservation organization that covers North America. Um, but I think they have some really great pollinator uh, resources. Um, if you do go there, check out their north central region. That's what includes the Canadian prairies. And some of the things that might be of interest or value are things like they have, you don't have to be an expert. They have these like easier to use habitat assessments. So you can assess your own land if you own land for pollinator habitat. Um, they have rangeland management guides if you're someone who's running cattle on the prairies. They have pesticide use best practices and recommendations. Um, and they also have guides for things like planting or habitat creation that include even cost, estimated costs if you're looking to do it on a larger scale. Similarly, pollinator.org, which is the Pollinator Partnerships website, has a lot of really uh, informative information as well across North America. Um, they actually have planting guides that are by different region within the prairie, so you can get one specific to where you live. They have pesticide use best practices. Uh, they also do a bee-friendly farming um, guidelines, and then you can actually get certified if you're a producer and that's something you'd want to add to your certification. And then I just wanted to recommend a few other things. We've got some books. I find the books by Heather Holm to be quite approachable. She's got pollinators and native plants and a couple others. You could also, if you want to like find out what you're looking at, there's a few apps that can help with that. You can stick on your phone. iNaturalist is a great one. If you can snap a photo of a pollinator, it'll help you identify what it is using expertise from around the world. Bumblebee Watch is a monitoring one that has um, identification information for bumblebees. You can report where you've seen them. And then there's some advocacy organizations. Be Better Manitoba uh, has a lot of hot tips. I wouldn't be surprised if there's some similar organizations in Saskatchewan and Alberta. Uh, B City Canada is also this national organization that has signed on a, actually a bunch of prairie cities. Brandon's one of them. There's several in Alberta. I'm not sure about Saskatchewan, where you can get information about advocating for pollinators in an urban context and maybe even get your city uh, designated as a B City. And then finally, I just wanted to highlight that over the last eight, probably 10 plus years, we're really starting to see increased research on prairie pollination. And it's really exciting. I'm not going to get into the names of everybody who's doing it, but I just wanted to highlight um, 
if this is an area of interest, you want to learn more, there's some really interesting research that's coming out of the U of M, the U of A, the U of S, the U of C. We've got researchers and experts at the Royal Saskatchewan Museum and the Manitoba Museum who are looking at pollinators. So I'm happy to point you in that direction if you want to learn more. Maybe you can look some of these folks up. Uh, we're seeing research on crop pollination, on habitat um, restoration. We're seeing research on pesticide effects in the prairies, specifically with canola. All kinds of different things going on right now. So it's actually a really exciting time for us to be learning more about this. I'm going to call it quits there. I've got my contact information right here, Marika Olenek at natureconservancy.ca. If anything you heard today is of interest or twigs something for you, you want to get more details about, please feel free to get in touch with me. I know I went over a lot of different things. I'm not always the number one expert, but I often might be able to help you find the right person. So please don't hesitate. And uh, I'll call it there and I'll pass it back over to Caitlin. First of all, thank you so much. That was a packed presentation. It was just loaded with information. So, mu so much there. <laughs> I'm glad that it's recorded because I might watch it again and take down a few more notes. <laughs> so thank you. Well, thanks again for having me. And I can't see anybody, but thank you all who have joined as well. <laughs> We've had a few questions come in, um, so we'll try to get through as many as we can. I know there's probably a few more on the way. Um, so if you don't know the answer, that's totally okay. Uh, the first one is from Penny. Do hummingbird moths pollinate? That's a good question. Uh, I would say yes. I don't know if I could say specifically which species they pollinate. Um, I do know that like some of the fairly closely related uh, species like hawk moths provide pollination to some orchids, for example. So yes, but I'm not gonna be able to say for sure how effective they are, which plants. No problem. Do you know of any studies that show crop yields are higher when located near pollinator habitat? Yeah, there's a bunch. Uh, a lot of them are not necessarily like from Saskatchewan, um, but generally across the board, it depends a bit on, on on the plant species, but yeah, mo most generally you're seeing better pollination from wild insects if you're near natural habitat and with greater amounts of natural habitat on the landscape. Okay, awesome. I think we did a webinar, I think it was last year, it could have been the year before, about prairie strips where um, people are now integrating like strips of prairie in their crop fields. So I guess that's been pretty successful as well. And that's on our YouTube channel. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I would actually, uh, some of the work at the University of Calgary that I've seen over the last few years, Paul Galpern's lab, um, has been looking at crop pollination and natural areas, and it's, it's, on, it's all about canola and the Canadian prairies, so if you want something more specific and more local, I'd suggest looking at some of their papers, G-A-L-P-E-R-N. Awesome. Okay, that is great. Thank you. Um, we have a couple questions about pesticides. Um, so Joe says, as a farmer in southeast Saskatchewan, the most important insect pests that he has to deal with are flea beetles. And I completely get it. I have them in my garden too. Um, so flea beetle damage occurs most uh, strongly against headlands on road ditches and fence rows where they move into the crop from their wintering habitat. Given that these habitats are also pollinator uh, habitats and I wish to avoid off-target effects of insecticides, what is the best management strategy to, to control flea beetles? I am not, I'm gonna have to pass on that one. I mostly am worried about land management for non-cropped areas, but I would suggest I believe strongly that there should be some good information out there. I would suggest having a look at the Pollinator Partnership and Xerxes Society resources. Am I still sharing my screen? Yes. I'll just flip back to that one just one sec. Um, and seeing if they have some specific resources there just as a place to start. Um, but I do think that uh, looking away from uh, that prophylactic use um, where you're basically targeting everything across the board is is going to be the most beneficial approach to trying not to have those off-target effects. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I get it. Like when I have kale, I like the flea beetles just decimate it in a matter of, of like a day. <laughs> it's crazy. So I couldn't imagine, you know, my livelihood depending on a crop and and it just could yeah. be gone because of the flea beetles. Like there's got to be something out there. So yeah. yeah. Um, and then Faye is wondering if there's a movement to start restricting pesticides for residential use. Um, and as you mentioned in your presentation, humans don't always read the directions and misuse is prevalent. Do you have any comments yeah. about that? 
Uh, I mean, it's generally at the municipal level when that occurs, municipal bylaws. Uh, Winnipeg, I don't actually know what Winnipeg has anymore. Winnipeg did have some restrictions, but maybe they changed. Um, but looking at, you're asking like, are there movements for that kind of thing? Looking at things like uh, the B-City advocacy movement might be a good place to, to start on that one. Um, and there definitely are other people that are looking into that. And and although I don't think we're gonna see that kind of restriction at like a national regulatory level, the, the bylaws um, and local bylaws are probably the spot that I've seen that be more effective. And I wouldn't be surprised if there are a lot of jurisdictions in Canada that do have examples of that that you could find. Yeah, I believe Ontario has um, has some bans on like Roundup, for example. Um, yeah. But I I think in Saskatchewan, unfortunately, um, there's still a lot of widespread use of it. Yeah. And that's yeah. where, yeah, maybe finding some some advocacy groups that can support you to get started on that at a local level might be helpful. Awesome. Um, and Claudia is wondering, um, so she says, so much information and inspiration to work towards establishing refugia, including urban backyards. Uh, the question is, are you able to comment on recent studies that link um, EMR, electromagnetic radiation, impacts to pollinator declines, cell towers, electrical power lines, radio waves, etc.? cetera? Um, personally, I have no direct knowledge of that. Uh, the literature that's out there and the research that has been done uh, doesn't have that as a primary cause. The causes that I've listed are, are far more important than anything else as far as I'm concerned and from the literature and research that I'm familiar with. So I would, I would suggest that, yeah, the provision of habitat is number one, pretty much above everything. And then, then you can go from there. Awesome, that's great. Um, we'll give everyone another minute to type in their questions. Um, that's all we've got right now. Uh, I just wanna remind everyone when you leave today's webinar, there'll be a quick one minute survey. If you don't mind filling it out, we always appreciate it. So uh, we actually read those surveys and report back to our funders in the future. Um, and if you didn't catch all of the webinar or if you know someone who would really enjoy it, it will be on our YouTube channel in the very near future. So you're welcome to share that as well. Um, doesn't look like we have any more questions coming in. <laughs> I always like to give everyone an extra minute or so because sometimes people are slower, but um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, I, and as I said, if anybody, you think of something later or you wanna get more in depth, like I said, I'm not always the expert in everything, but I often know where to find more information. So anyone can feel free to get in touch if there's no more questions right now. Okay, um, one more popped in. <laughs> Does glyphosate cause issues with pollinators? That's a good question. Um, there is some recent research I was uh, reviewing a little while ago and it looks like, yes, there's some of those sublethal effects um, have been seen on pollinators from glyphosate where it's affecting their neurological or like health condition. And so I don't know the exact details or the pathways of that, um, but yeah, there is some evidence that that is likely to have some cumulative effects over time um, on the health of pollinator communities. Okay, thanks for that answer. Well, it looks like all the questions that we have today, and um, I really like what Claudia said, so much information and inspiration. So um, thank you. This was a really great presentation. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. I had a good time. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone for catching today's webinar, and hopefully we'll see you later today for uh, talk about plants and drainage. <laughs> okay, thank you. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Bye.